Hello everyone, today we talk about Anglo-Saxon military organization between 600 to 1066 circa, right? And we will skip a historiographical context which we will offer in other videos, of course we will refer to it broadly but not uh, specifically. And I'm actually happy to talk about this topic specifically because uh, we've never actually discussed Anglo-Saxon warfare, which is instead very interesting. Also one of the um, few documented cases of um, continuity, let's say, of a people and its own institutions. And of course we're evolving over time, but essentially throughout all the early Middle Ages, actually. So it's basically half of a millennium of history, uh, if not more. And naturally this makes it all the more interesting. So, the basis of Anglo-Saxon military organization was the obligation of every freeman between 15 and 60 years old to perform military service. And this force constituted the very famously known third. When we talk about 15, 60 years old, of course, we're talking here about the what was the, the approximate range of actual combat capability from from the side of a, essentially of an adult male, right? So this was technically the, the wall levy of all uh, able-bodied freemen that um, could be brought to war. As we will see now, this form of recruitment was mm, fundamentally theoretical and it fell out of use pretty soon if there actually had ever been because frankly I have certain you know questions regarding to the fact of how much was actually um, already mm, you know militarized and stratified uh, Anglo-Saxon society when I mean during the invasion of Britain right of the long invasion of Britain because it actually you know you know that along the, the so-called Litus Saxonicum the Anglo-Saxons have started settling since the third century at least, and even though if the Anglo-Saxons objectively weren't so politically cohesive as other populations that migrated from Central and Northern Europe that eventually formed kind of more structured kingdoms and so on, uh, however the ideal of kind of every single freeman to actually participate to, to the major expedition was uh, a rare eventuality, right? Um, these were systems that we'll see now had essentially a, an elite uh, sort of class that would um, structure, uh, structure itself, especially after the settlement uh, over the centuries of um, semi-professional or not actually professional um, uh, troops that uh, actually carried out most of, of the work while the rest of the freemen, you know, after, especially after sedentarization, weren't, I mean, they, they could be used, of course, to kind of raiding um, raid style warfare and this kind of um, border contents among the, the, these various small kingdoms in Britain, but um, not being actually a force that was habituated, let's say, to take part to military expeditions on a regular base as professionals could do, right? So this was very ideal, and actually the Anglo-Saxons do not may, do, do not differ from any other uh, Germanic. Uh, population, any other Romano-Germanic kingdom, let's say, um, in terms of the, the, the so-called herban. So this mm, theoretical um, possibility of letting actually every single ab uh, able-bodied freeman, right, in case of, of emergency, of war, right. And this, that, albeit happening, um, wasn't definitely the norm. Albeit we should stress, too, that the selective fear that we will see in a while it was a kind of a more organized, in fact, selected and a better organized, for sure, form of recruitment. Uh, you know, wasn't probably, albeit we distinguish these two, you know, um, types, historiographically speaking, wasn't probably formalized, sanctioned, uh, sanctioned actually. And this is this is important because um, Anglo-Saxon military organization for for a long time was really very uh, kind of fragmented and autonomous in this sense. So every community uh, was able in this regard to, you know, to take measures the in, in, you know, independently. And, um, and this naturally speaks also for a, a relatively high degree of militarization in, compared probably to other populations that lived in, in, in Europe at the time uh, that instead had kind of a more stratified society for which it was effectively just the elite that was taking um, 
you know, the initiative in certain mil political and military um, decisions, while, you know, Anglo-Saxon customs and culture also, as we we know, historically speaking, throughout the Middle Ages, have always been centered in this kind of substantial force of the of the middle class of freemen, right? This would be interrupted by the Norman conquest in part, but the legacy lived on, and um, you know. But now we're going uh, a bit too far. Um, st staying to to the third, right? So this the third, the general, so-called general third, it wasn't called like that at the time, but we define it for, for the sake of simplicity here, was only due uh, in the locality of each respective shire, and for one day only. Um, so this is very theoretical, right? Uh, because, you know, what can you do actually in a day only if just a police, um, you know, activity fundamentally? And in fact, pay was instead necessary if any additional service was required. And this is also typical of all the other Roman Germanic kingdoms. Uh, a 15 day period of service two weeks seems to have been more usual, um, especially in those areas w were exposed to kind of foreign threat, for example, on the Welsh and Scottish borders, mm -hmm. were somewhat more more active in, over you know throughout all British history um, in the mi Middle Ages. And being inadequately trained and ill-armed, the general third, often referred to as, in fact, the, the general, as we have seen, or great third, and was rarely summoned except in emergencies, such as, for example, large-scale attacks that, as we know, on, in Anglo-Saxon um, England actually occurred. Hmm? Uh, think about the Viking invasions, of course, but there could be more than that conflictuality, maybe on a more intense scale, Right, but the actual third, like the one that we w was effectively carried out more regularly, was um, effectively more often selective in the sense that uh, there was a selection of the men, of the free men, that had to serve in the army. Right, and usually with this proportion of one man serving from each five hides of land. And the the height here is a measure that has been es estimated um, as equivalent to, uh, let's say, between 60 and 120 old acres that are fundamentally approximately 30 modern acres. Um, that is in metric decimal metric system, um, essentially 120,000 squared meters. Hence, um, a terrain of a uh, square terrain of 346 meters circa, but per per side, um, but uh, over time this was actually more like um, a theoretic, it was not a, an actual f form of um, of measurement, but actually just an administrative division, there were heights of in fact different dimensions, this is typical of other, um, you know, it's like the Mansus in the um, in, in, for example, in Frankish or Longobard laws of recruitment, and uh, the important though is con conceiving here there was a parcelization of the land plots in in a way, and you know there's some possession as a unit of measure that could you know be more or less um, it could more or less fit into these um, regulations that uh, in fact had to provide the uh, for for the military, and in this specifically this selective uh, f uh, feared. And the, the single man who was called from uh, out, out of these five hides was generally expected to be equipped with a helmet, mail, corselet and provisions for two months hmm? or four shillings a hide uh, normally supplied by the other landholders within the five hide unit in proportion to the land they held. Typical system that was particularly important, uh, if anything, for economical reasons. Like, it, it, it was obvious that not all the, you know, couple of, of, of let's say, how many inhabitants did Anglo-Saxon England held, it's a couple of millions, it was impossible to fill all the able-bodied freemen of, of England, which was, first of all, unfeasibly, politically speaking, secondly, um, economically, third, logistically, right? But more especially, these people had to work their land. 
this is a pre-industrial system when people ferment, fundamentally survive at levels of production that surpass uh, barely the uh, survival uh, one, um, and uh, therefore, you know, um, you know, if you took these guys all away from their land, it would have caused a major economic blow. And but it wasn't neat. Like this is a problem they never ever posed themselves. Like th this were uh, relations and mechanisms that were naturally, um, uh, you know, evident in the political practice of the time. It was not even uh, a matter of wondering about that. Um, but naturally, those who remained were to provide for the supplies of the guy who went to war. And this was typical, once again, of all the Romano-Germanic laws of recruitment, and it worked just like in this case. Um, the mm, the size of a height, as we were saying, varied from region to region. It was not even used in the ex Dane law, for example, where um, it has been estimated that one man served from each uh, carucades, um that is a not better specified land of measure, uh, land measure, uh, or Kent, for example, where service was assessed in solungs, hmm? um, and towns were assessed at one or to 20 men, depending on their size, in five height units. Hmm? And unlike the Great Third, uh, the uh, Select Third, as we have defined it, served beyond its own borders and even overseas under Knut um, the Great. And th this is important because you, you realize what's the need in here, is having troops that can be effectively supplied uh, territorially speaking, and that can theoretically even participate to expeditions overseas. Um, these were kind of rare, telling you the truth, because it, it's always been a problem, and th this was a problem, I don't know, even in 14th century England by certain standard uh, for the drafts and all. So uh, we'll see that in actually in the late, um, like during the 11th century, that there is an increase in professionalization. Much of this service was actually uh, provided with uh, with money or other uh, goods, actually, um, it, it, the equivalent of the military service. And this was very easy because aside from the fact that there were mercenaries all around, especially in this later phase, um, you know, it, it, it also was kind of logistically easier. Like people who wanted to to uh, enlist simply came under your your controller or, or were already there, as we will see later with the uh, the things, uh, especially the uh, but all, especially the household troops of the Anglo-Saxon kings, and um, so this was jo just a way to implement um, certain military clientels that already existed by themselves. So actually leaving, you know, uh, alone. Uh, if not for for this actually important sum that they had to to, to that will have to be paid of the, the rest of the of the peasantry essentially, um, calculating the the amount of the um, th let's say the, the military potential of Anglo-Saxon England that is a late tenth century copy of an earlier original lists the total heightage of Mercia, Wessex, Kent. Lindsay, Helmet, Witchy, East and South Saxons, East Angles, and various smaller regions at over 230,000 hides, which means that the select feared on the base of uh, um, one man per five hides would levy uh, an arm of 45,000, right, which for the listed areas at least. So this is actually a big number, and and this is interestingly enough the limit of more or less what what can be the the uh, logistical capacity probably of the same Anglo-Saxon um, England um, as a you know as, as its greatest effort uh, militarily speaking, but also the one of that armies had of, at the time for effectively leading. Um, commanding tactically this man on the field, like when you arrive at fifty thousand, uh, at that point it, it's a miracle if you really can't coordinate them all. Um, so it's it, it's interesting because it's um, it it's, it really speaks for um, 
after all, a realistic amount and not such a theoretical force, right? O obviously, if you know, even if the the, the Anglo-Saxon armies were regularly much much smaller than this. So we could define the third, and now we will go a bit more in depth with that conceptually. However, in modern terms, um, something like a citizen militia uh, of part-timers who went to war only in time of crisis and then often reluctantly telling the truth. This was the Anglo-Saxon levy or third. Um, so the third or levy of the common people seems to have developed out of the old Germanic custom that all fit men had to be ready to serve in war uh, when the need arose. Like, I don't think there is evidence of previous use of, of the name specifically that we can connect back to, to the continent. Um, so, but it, it's basically the same identical structure. Like, and actually, I could be wrong, but the important is that it doesn't matter. Like, the, this thing was practicing the same exact way, uh, not just in Anglo-Saxon England, but also in the rest of Britain, uh, among tribal, um, the other um, tribal populations, right? So, naturally, we start knowing more uh, as the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms became established. Mm? And wars, which had earlier been endemic, right, from the phase of invasion and, and adaptment, adjustment, whatever you, you want to call it, had become... Um, less frequent, right? So um, the population naturally, uh, the Anglo-Saxons largely mixed actually with the pre-existing British population and they became increasingly settled and agricultural as a consequence and like basically every other Germanic people who settled down uh, in post-Roman uh, Europe, less warlike. This is normal. You know, all the deal of the migration era is actually uh, aimed at finding new pastures, new new land to settle down, right? This is not just about continuing, living on with raiding, etc. Of course, there is all a culture that is, and actually in Anglo-Saxon England remains definitely uh, probably more than in, in any other post-Roman land. I mean, it's continuity with the tribal mindset and background and uh, even combativity in part um, from, especially from an individual point of view. Um, yet, um, you know the 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 tendency is naturally you know you you settle down you have your land you have your house uh you have your i don't know uh animals and 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 you can leave without you know going stealing um on a regular base through raids like these other populations that are come from central northern europe who are used to do because local simply because locally speaking they didn't have enough resources to live otherwise by the way right and this changes uh but naturally conflicts even in britain of continued, and especially with the native British um, and neighboring Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Um, this clashes erupted mm, somewhat sporadically, we can't say, and had to be dealt, however, still with the, the raising, by the raising of the, the uh, population in defense of their homes from both sides. So, the, the first written legal obligation to brief spells of military service appears in the so-called Loves of King Ein of Wessex, written in around 694. Um, and this required all free men between the ages of 15 and 60, as we have seen before, to take part in military service when summoned. That's where we kind of get that, that, those numbers. And as we've said before, this is pretty loose, like also because people didn't leave at the time more than, you know, usually 60, 70, so, and um, I, I'll bite they aged kind of faster, so even 15 is actually a, a somewhat a late uh, age uh, by certain standards, but not so much after all. And service was mainly defensive in this regard, um, as the main raised in such way um, could be of only limited military value by themselves, which... Uh, given that this general fear entailed no um, further military performance, like we know, of course, that these populations were framed under the, the guidance of an aristocracy, of someone who took care of the local uh, political as well as military organization, and therefore there were certain services, m more or less, that this community is owed in, in certain fashion, uh, by a certain degree to these aristocracies. So naturally there was some form of recruitment, but this was essentially militia. I mean, there were 
uh, people will even knew by by lifestyle how to use weapons, how to to use a spear, to use a, a bow. Like these were traditions that were maintained, if anything, because they 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 served some purpose still at the time. It was quite of a you know in the same Anglo-Saxons fought habitually uh, one against the other. So th this was normal, but still the level wasn't you know surely wasn't professional, but not even semi-professional in this um, general level. Um, and that that that's why we call this mass levy of populace as the general fear. Um, so, of course, as we were saying before, the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms developed over time, and it was seen that a more selective system of recruitment would be more useful. Hmm? Uh, if fewer men were levied, the remaining men freed of the obligation could contribute to the levied men's expenses and a majority of men could continue to work the land and produce a surplus. And this is where the selected feared uh, is born from, and this meant naturally that these troops could be better armed, and probably also better trained, in a way or another. And it's obvious that if you select one person out of uh, you know uh, this community inhabiting this five uh, hides, well, this person is going to be most likely also the kind of the most fit for for combat in in, in some way it'll be in, i mean it's natural like that as a form of agreement or oh, not only we can't imagine the, the word injustices relatively to this as well but um the concept is naturally that if you if you really the community has to, even to participate with its own wealth to you know this this person equipment and supplies well yeah, th those were prob this was a person that they knew, that they kind of counted on, and that they had to send anyway. So at that point, it was uh, important even to think in 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 function of of these future expeditions. So it's actually from this system, from the select feared, that something more, you know, advanced start starts happening. It didn't happen just through this institution. It obviously, happened broadly, uh, politically and socially. We will see it now with the Thanes, especially, and later on, even with their substitution with the Huscarls um, in the 11th century, how th this worked. Um, and, and, and still, however, in this sense, we, it, it's healthy to like never draw a sharp distinction between the select and general fear as such, because uh, they were probably blurred. Uh, as far as we understand, um, these communities worked uh, together as a set of, you know, overlapping clientels that had in various interests in common, that had aristocracies that kind of managed these broader movements and, and military participations, um, and, and, and therefore began to develop their own kind of military organization. And the tendency is always, the more society stratifies, which definitely happen in Anglo-Saxon England, albeit not so radically, for example, like in Francia, um, the, it's, it's generally who is at the top that by detaining political power automatically owns the, the military one by definition. Um, which means that there is probably a, also a disarmament of, of the population by a certain degree over time. There is a gentrification of even impor impoverishment, let's say gentrification of certain classes that maybe even you know were more engaged into traffic, trade, commerce, not just uh, war, and probably largest amount of the population that instead overall got somewhat poorer over time, or at least kind of more uh, dependent on more powerful um, oligarchs, right? So. Mm, little, little survives in Anglo-Saxon sources of the actual details of the select third system. Um, much of what we know comes from a later text that is uh, the Domesday Book entry for the county of Berkshire in 1089, so we are after Norman conquest. Um, and this is simply because the Normans retained the organizational structure of Anglo-Saxon England as the base of their tax system. This is very important because it, it tells you that the, um, telling the truth, but by the time of the Norman conquest, the Anglo-Saxons had one of the, if, if not probably the most uh, efficient administrative system um, in Europe. And this was based traditionally, like it, it was actually not a, um, early medieval kingdoms, um, 
based in fact on the original military um, duty. Um, and, and this was naturally aimed at assessing how much property you owned, right? So uh, on, on the basis of which you could be taxed and or participating to the military. Now consider that um, the, uh, the the major expanses in general of all of these powers were regularly military, uh, right? Th th this was this was it. Like this was a, 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 oh, it's not like today that we plan like the, the building of massive infrastructure. Actually, the Anglo Saxons did something like that. Uh, think about Office Dyke, for example, or the burgs that were built to kind of even as logistical bases to counter the the Viking invasions. But they were kind of modest. Um, and they cost it a lot, telling the truth, and this is why, in fact, they even interfered with the third system uh, in a measure, uh, but we'll see it a, a bit better later. Um, but in, in general, the, the overwhelming expense of this political and social system was war, right, and, and nothing else. Um, and it was a continuous, like these were all powers that were kind of squishing, like pushing one against the other, making pressure, etc., and expanding and gaining more. You know, uh, Anglo-Saxon England has various, you know, power shifts over time, from Mercia to, to, to Wessex, you know, to this broader um, expansion. And, and of course, of external military pressure uh, from the... From, from the Scandinavian invaders. And naturally, everything was also kind of locally customized as well. However, though the Berkshire model was not applied identically in all the other English shires, um, it kind of you know, it gives a good idea of the basis of the recruitment of the fair. Mm -hmm. um, the Berkshire Dunstay entry states, uh, quote, if the king sent any army anywhere, one soldier went from five hides, each hide providing four shillings towards his wages and subsistence for two months. Mm -hmm. So, as we have seen, this hide was a unit of land traditionally, the amount considered uh, necessary to support one man and his family. This was the concept behind the hide. Um, and as we have seen as well, in, in practice the hide was not fixed inside, but varied depending on the quality of soil in different areas considered this too. The word naturally, uh, like the south, w was richer um, and that's also where probably the uh, the system got kind of more f fluidified in this regard because uh, the land plots were, um, let's say, commercialized m more easily. Like probably there was not a great uh, economical dynamism we we're, were thinking about early medieval Europe, but still, you know, this Anglo-Saxon England was framed in, you know, in, in continental traffic, etc. So, uh, Southern England was naturally more connected to the rest of Europe and, and richer on average, uh, also just environmentally speaking. Um, and the, the height, for example, in Berkshire measured about 40 acres. Um, by the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, uh, the height had, however, become rather a, an administrative term than one of measurement. Right, um, And at that point, the the, the record that in fact had been highly fiscalized and which means that people actually participated less to to the fair as such and uh, they were rather to support more professional troops sometimes even non-anglo-saxon ones uh, for for the military service um, so one man was to be recruited for every five hides in the shire and this five hide unit turns up frequently in the earlier sources and seems to have been a basic administrative unit. Um, men living within the five hides would have to club together to provide the equipment for the men and to provide an additional sum of money for his maintenance and campaign. Um, this is important because when you hear like you need all the supplies that you have to bring with you like there were not many ways to preserve food, were they? And um, th these measures were quite very ideal. Like the concept of supply is more than else at this point how wealth you can put together, and possibly even to monetize or to, um, however, yeah, there were sh surely some some 
food that was brought together. But when we think of military organization, historically speaking, the, the myth of the kind of the peasant soldier that um, star, you know, leaves home for military uh, duty, all loaded with I don't know cheese and uh, and meat and all this stuff, is quite ideal. Um, it's obvious that the, the local communities and the, the greater um, you know, the, the earls and who, whoever, the kings who were um, in charge of the military organization m dealt largely, um, uh, uh, you know, with the, the organization of, of the logistic train proper. And, and therefore, we can see in here a, a certain level of, of centralization by, by sheer practice, right? It was not anything, you know, particularly advanced, but it was still worked because this society was was early medieval, so we have to realize that, not to compare with other systems, and it did work well, right, that there wasn't, after all, many, there weren't many other ways to do that, and uh, the world, uh, you know, went on essentially like that. Um, 20 units of five hides made up the next administrative subunit of the Shire, that was known, in fact, as the Hundred. And this too seems to have a, um, been a military um, subunit in that the 20 men raised from the 100 would probably have served the campaign together. Right, so here we get into organics and we, we, we know very few actually of how the, these armies were, were organized practically, but we can assume that like in other countries the, 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 the system was decimal and uh which is kind of ironic talking about uh England in this regard. Um but pass me the joke. And um but that there was this this further subdivision of kind of platoons, um I I don't know, can't know, that of people who effectively knew each other. So that was very important. We 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 do know that uh, you know, the Germanic peoples also had this strong um in fact communitary ethos that uh, through which they, they compensated actually the lack of discipline that a centralized state that they didn't have could have given them, like, I don't know, in the Byzantine Empire. Um, and therefore, familial ties were very important also for the sake of morale and sticking together in face of the enemy in battle. Hmm? Which kind of makes sense. So in the 10th century, Wessex went through, um, as we know, a resurgence of fortune and uh, extended its power northwards um, Anglo-Saxon uh, Thanes, uh, that we will see in a while, as a essentially, we can't say semi or wholly professional military force, but it was kind of a hybrid between the two things. Uh, we had maintained their the, the ones who were organized essentially that were in charge of organizing the army locally, uh, and well, those Anglo-Saxon Thanes who had maintained their holdings under Viking rule and new landholders of Scandinavian descent were incorporated into the third. Mm -hmm. So there is this phase in which naturally Anglo-Saxon England kind of compacts uh, itself around um, Wessex rule and reabsorbs certain territories that had been lost during the, um, the, the Scandinavian invasions and these are reintegrated essentially in the third proper while you know uh, having been part previously of of a different military system. Um, and the unit of assessment for military service in these territories was the carucate that we mentioned before. Um, and we, we don't know how large the carucate actually was, uh, but we think that conceptually, especially given those administrative grounds that we have traced before, it was equivalent to the height itself. Um, for example, uh, Stamford in Lincolnshire uh, a town that was f uh, had been founded by the Vikings was assessed at 150 carucates, giving an obligation to raise 30 men. Mm -hmm. So here you see the same relation of 1 to 5 that we encountered in the Hyde as well. Uh, another, uh, al another northern English administrative division was the uh, Wapentake, if I pronounce it correctly, it seems to have been the equivalent of the hundred in, in the south. So this was a larger one. And uh, the five height system uh, naturally has this great similarities with other uh, uh, recruitment systems, but we can find uh, all over Europe, as we have seen before, especially the one of Carolingian Francia, but also of the Longobard Kingdom, for example. 
and the uh, Charlemagne, for example, in a capitulary of 807, establishes that, quote, each freeman who seems to hold five months shall likewise come to the army. So the Manses, as such, uh, was this household, land plot, what, whatever, that here has even the same, um, you know, uh, re re numerical relation with per man levied uh, of the English hide. And this is kind of like, maybe a coincidence, maybe it's a common Germanic origin of, of the Franks and, and the Anglo-Saxons, but you know this um it it's also probable by the way that the english were influenced by the actually by the carolingian practice proper by the 8th century that you know was just across the channel of course and was you know the franks even namely uh had namely extended in previous times some sort of you know um of rule completely nominal over 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 the anglo-saxons etc so um it's possible that th there was a sort of Anglo-Saxon imitation of Frankish models. Always bear in mind, though, that the um, wealth distribution was radically different between Anglo-Saxon England and Frankish uh, Francia. Uh, let's pass the um, in in France the. Uh, you know, th there was a, a massive social certification that is present in no other um, Western European country, um, which is what enables, effectively, uh, the Carolingians to produce this truly professional, heavily armored um, core of uh, of troops through which they, they conquer uh, half of Europe. Uh, in Anglo-Saxon England, the, there was likely a higher per capita wealth, uh, which means that the uh, society was less stratified, that freemen had more power, right, I on average. But this is n n not necessarily, like, it's better, of course, in terms of, uh, this is something we discussed on Schwerpunkt a lot of times, but uh, it means, yeah, okay, you you have more individual wealth, but this doesn't mean that society necessarily works better. Um, uh, and that's why the Carolingians conquer half of Europe and the Anglo-Saxons don't, don't like other peoples by the way so uh, it's it's wholly relevant and it's a complicated um, thing but th this is also what makes the Anglo-Saxons fascinating because they're actually a model differently from basically every other um, Romano-Germanic power that, that gets either swallowed by the, the Carolingians or conquered by the Arabs um, that, that survives up to the second half of the 11th century, uh, relatively intact, obviously massively influenced in the second part, let's say, by, by the, the Scandinavian um, uh, invasions, but that, that in fact, didn't have, you know, the Scandinavians didn't have such a dramatically different military system after all, right? Of course, Anglo-Saxon England was kind of more advanced, more uh, better organized. Um, North Central, of course, was my, uh, more advanced in this regard, but th th um, the Anglo-Saxons are the only people you can trace this, this evolution into a... Um, it, I mean, uh, the Anglo-Saxons are essentially the only example of a somewhat advanced population that maintains its um, political and social structures intact without being, um, you know, Im Im imposed the, uh, the Carolingian models that, ironically, will arrive with the Norman conquest, obviously, kind of, um, that were essentially the same. Like, they, they weren't Carolingian proper at that point, but they essentially were conceptually the same thing, and that's why, eventually, actually, the, the Norman conquest of England was, was dram very dram dramatic in, in, for Anglo-Saxon society, and, uh, but we will maybe see that on, an, on another occasion. So, what about the, I mean, the variety in the third, in terms of social differences proper like was there segmentation in this regard well yeah um, the love of Ein refers to the rank and file members of the general feared as seals or commoners uh, be it the venerable also indirectly implies that seals served as warriors when he laments 
um, a tendency amongst all classes in Northumbria uh, at his time uh, to adopt a, a monastic life, right? And um, the uh, Jesuits and the later Thanes seem to have had mostly a supervisory role in the general field, as we'll see now. Um, well, the the select field was somewhat different in, uh, in that it contained fewer seals, so actually, um, and, and instead a rather larger proportion of thanes. Mm -hmm. So that's the the progressive stratification we were talking about, even at a kind of middle, uh, lower class level, like in this case. Um, the thanes actually could be actually very even upper middle and even uh, upper class, technically speaking. Um, but this this changes started from within what had been originally the the much kind of more homogeneous middle class of Anglo-Saxon invaders. Um, the preponderance of Thanes in the third is stressed particularly by Abbot Elfric of Ainsham, who at the beginning of the 11th century saw Anglo-Saxon society uh, as organized into essentially three orders of men. Uh, those who work, the seers, those who pray for God's help, the clergy, and those who fight, the thanes. Now, this is very interesting because this corresponds to the famous ecclesiastical tripartite order that you find uh, contemporarily also in the in Frankish uh, Europe, uh, and that ideally subdivides society essentially in workers, the clergy, and the warriors, right? And, but but it's somewhat accurate, telling the truth, uh, at that point because mm, society was was really tripper, uh, like it, it was. Uh, there were, of course, these classes kind of overlapped, right? Uh, the clergy also had certain military roles, for example. They they even led certain Anglo-Saxon bishops led arm, armies on, in war to war. Um, uh, the seers could participate towards well, so but it's obvious that the taints at that point and also other professional troops um, were the were really the real the really war guys, right? And uh, that's it. So um, the localized fear of England who made up the bulk of the fighting forces during the Norman invasion of 1066. Um, would have consisted um, of, of of thanes and of unknown proportion of superior seers probably and by the way the the anglo-saxon effort in the 1066 campaign was was utterly amazing and it actually shows a system that in spite of all you know the the crisis that was taking place because this thing was Evolving slowly towards something much more. I mean, actually, had already evolved towards a, you know, uh, much towards a privatistic tendency, etc. But it still shows that the the broader um, kind of administrative and logistical system of England was pretty damn advanced at the time. And it's it's amazing in the first place the Anglo-Saxons managed to to move their army from the south up to Stamford Bridge, defeat the Norwegians and then coming back to face the Normans and basically winning the battle because the Anglo-Saxons had de facto won the battle if they hadn't broken their ranks to to uh, bait to what is considered a faint flight but actually probably it was uh, you know it's very d difficult to distinguish that from a, a route from the Normans uh, side that eventually counter-attacked counter-charged and we know we all know how it ended, but th this works. Th this shows a system that was consistently functional um, by many standards of the time. From this largely still popular base, which other countries now had completely abandoned, because in, by 1066 the rest of Europe was basically dominated by the uh, by the, the aristocratic um, chivalric elite, and uh, say equestrian elite better. And, and and the rest of of the people were yeah they did participate to war in, in in times of you know of need but you know they had probably much less power than and essentially at that point the Anglo-Saxon military machine was an Anglo-Danish one uh, at that point and 
and that's really what why the Norman conquest of of England changed um really so much because by that point uh anglo saxon England fitted more uh, as a model into the broader kind of northern european and even scandinavian in um, by by in part system than in fact the one was developing on 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 the continent was very very different and that's why in fact the Norman conquest eventually was so traumatic politically and socially uh, always bearing in mind though the Normans that were definitely smart um, maintained much of Anglo-Saxon uh, administration and even military system uh, standing because evidently it worked pretty well in fact that's what the Normans uh, you know before the, their civil wars can achieve pretty damn well um, that is to to counter in part the, the power of the barons with the, the popular the popular strength which however had suffered a, a pretty massive blow with, with, with the conquest and 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 the sheer think about the campaign itself like here we are in early medieval times you you don't really you can't truly really levy such big armies uh for for a seasonal campaign of that proportion um every year like you you you're going to exhaust the system so these are things that really matter can make um, generational difference in in the way certain systems um, are going to evolve so let's talk a bit about the the taints instead by the 11th century uh, the the taints uh, the, the, they were essentially these lesser noblemen that usually held estates of five hides of land themselves which means they were like while other guys would just have to get together to 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 make five hides. Uh, this this the Taints owned already five hides or more by themselves. So this was the kind of gentry, and they and they constituted very likely the, the actual bulk of the select third. And uh, the Taints were also obliged to enforce the military service of the other men on their estates and took command of the local contingents. So this wasn't just a matter of being rich or better. Uh, being rich equated in the sense of having more political and military power in your society. So you, as a Tain, you actually have the the force uh, to impose to, to the rest of the community military service. And then naturally w went in parallel with a sort of autonomization of, of of Thanes in general. Um, it could happen that uh, in an area that, that there was no Thane, um, especially it wasn't a particularly florid uh, one economically speaking, so if no Thane was, was, were present within a five height unit then the military service was performed by uh, one of the upper m class peasants that were called uh, actually in different names there are knights um uh, that reminds the connection which is the the serf like but you also know kind of in a military sense the ratmanni or the genets so who were these things properly well um they can be defined essentially the most important element of the anglo-saxon army uh from the earliest days and we will see a, a bit better you know that there weren't properly taints at, uh, at the time, or at least they weren't called like that, but there were some equivalent of it, uh, up to the Norman conquest. The taints were a class of, n uh, you know, of freemen slash noblemen warrior. Um, what is convenient to to call simply tain, um, that um, originally is a term that means servant, right? Um, that was a man who held land from the king or another hereditary noble by right of military service he owed that person so he was a kind of a proto you know he was a part of a military clientele substantially and uh it was a the thing wasn't just a, a, a military um person like he was also he had certain civilian duties as well mm -hmm. uh the thing ranked um, between an ordinary freeman and an hereditary noble, right? And it is respect to what is a nobleman, but because you know, the nobility in early medieval Europe is kind of a problem. Uh, it's it's just about the aristocracy in practice. Whoever has 
power proper. Uh, Anglo-Saxon England doesn't have a great deal of dynastization, like at least at the level of, I don't know, that happens in, 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 in France, right? Uh, but essentially, in, in the ancient Germanic mindset, a freeman is technically um, n has a kind of a noble status by being a freeman proper. Then, of course, there are the, the oligarchs, the aristocrats, who are you know kind of more prosperous, and that's because um, essentially the, the heavens have blessed him for, for his power and might um, to have that status, and, and that's how they, they you know. They, certification eventually uh, evolves because these people tend to get richer and to monopolize to control um, larger chunks of society uh, etc so the things are fundamentally framed um, within this um, system at kind of the lower status of um, above the, the freeman all right um, and it's interesting because the land that they were they owned um and actually i think the taints had kind of had personal property themselves but their fortune was made largely through the you know uh, management of these uh, the nobiliar lands right that in, in that sense however could not pass down automa automatically to the taints uh descendants because it was not their own theoretically like even in Anglo-Saxon England, like you find in the Vassalitic beneficiary system in France, etc., you you see that this effectively happened. And in fact, from the Thain, uh, the Thanes class would, you know, emerge sometimes. Also, those who, you know, especially in in early Anglo-Saxon England, this uh, you know social mobility was pretty pretty fluid, right? Um, and that's why, in fact, the role of, of the Thane changed as the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms developed. The, the meaning of the term Thane was also not consistent and went through subtle changes. Um, in the early Anglo-Saxon period, the immediate military followers of a king were called um, Jesuits um, rather than Thanes. And originally uh, the word uh, Jesuit, if, if I pronounce it correctly by the way, meant uh, something like um, like companion um, in the case uh, of a close retainer of a king or lord uh, or a close personal follower were also protected and fought by the side of his lord in battle because j it, etymologically speaking is uh, the you know strengthening of concept and then um civits, um which means um in pre germanic even the kind of long lasting i mean something someone who remains faithful for, for a long time uh, there is an equivalent for example in the in the longer bird gazindius right um and uh, these are shared uh, germanic terms and um the so th these people were actually the, the same man who per, who constituted the bodyguard or at least the war bands of of the first anglo-saxon chieftains that uh, invaded britain and um, there were the personal followers and uh, retinues, and uh, this makes you realize how kind of close to, uh, how primitive and close to the heroic model was the ancient Anglo-Saxon society. Like this idea that still, you know, there was the, the champion that ruled, like, but it was uh, with, with the followers, with the retinue. Um, but in kind of a in small groups, uh, as a matter of fact, we know that. I mean, I don't know, by the time of the conquest, like uh, an army could count, I don't know, 60 people. Like we were talking really about this, this level of fragmentation, and that's how essentially Anglo-Saxon migrations occurred uh, at the end of the day. Um, and but this makes you understand better what's the personal characterization of this of this figure, originally speaking. Now, as eventually the Anglo-Saxons conquered territory in Britain. Um, loyal Jesuits were rewarded with grants of land, right? So they finally uh, got what they struggled for. And so gradually Jesuit came to mean a landowner or landholder better, who was expected um, in virtue of that property to raise troops from among the peasants living on his land. This is basically the origin of, of, of the role 
in Anglo-Saxon England, and towards the end of the 8th century, the word Thane, in fact, begins to replace the word Jesuit as such, and the royal Thanes, who held their land directly from the king, were naturally the most prestigious ones. They often became officials of the crown. Some of them were eminent statesmen telling the truth, such as Wolfric, for example, the, so, the, the Welsh Reeve, as it was called, who was responsible for collecting the tribute from Wales, and who died in 897. Um, and this official capacity need not have kept uh, him from military duties, and he may have commanded Welsh auxiliaries in battle as well. So these were men of, you know, of great... Um, they were the ro royal agents with, entrusted with significant power, uh, especially at the military level. Um, and other King Stains mentioned... Um, in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle were in fact war heroes. For example, Ordech, uh, killed with many fellow Thanes in the victory over the Vikings at Exeter in 894. A, a Thane served his king as more than just a, a warrior. The modern division between warfare and statecraft did not yet exist. Which explains you how totalizing these um, bonds uh, were actually felt what the word actually perceived I mean in a society where you have a few um, like a a weak central authority like in the Anglo-Saxon world you, you, you need to rely on this personal connections on loyalty and things that they were very praised in fact traditionally by the Germanic world because they didn't have any other way to essentially build something greater right of course Anglo-Saxon England evolves and in this regard as we will see even political and military structures um, improved dramatically over time. Um, at the lower echelons of the Tainly class, there were men who had been given uh, lands in the provinces that were, however, away from the royal household. And their lands did not at first pass down automatically in a Tain's family and remained technically the property of the king right this is present actually even in 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 the frankish world as such but when you know even i don't know in charlemagne's minds that theoretically everything belonged to the king um, because these lands were considered as lands of conquest and therefore personal possessions ideally and that's also actually what william the conqueror will see england like right um, and that's the reason why this land technically belonged to whoever had conquered before and that could dispose of it through, you know, uh, heritage. With the increase in the use of writing towards the end of the 7th century, uh, land grants were recorded in a book, uh, a book uh, in a system known as Bokland, right? Bokland. Um, and as the population of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms grew, um, it became virtually impossible uh, at that point for the king to ha have a direct personal knowledge, not just of control, but of actual knowledge of all of his several thousand subjects of middle rank. And Buckland was restored to for keeping track of all of them. Land grants to Thanes could no longer be just a personal matter between king and Thane as such, and uh, the Thanes' heirs could now expect to inherit the estate al almost automatically by book right. Um, and thus was born the, uh, let's say, the hereditary nobleman, let's say, uh, or tenant or, uh, that w w was to become so typical uh of, of medieval England, as uh, high medieval England as well as uh, other uh, region in Europe. This is important because it, it actually shows what, what I've always, you can tell you should observe um, all over Europe, like that we, sometimes we look at the Carolingians and say, oh, look at these guys, they brutally accelerated social stratifications, they, they built a society in which basically they were and a strikingly few people with an enormous amount of wealth and a huge mass of, of other people just had to work for them and they owned uh, practically nothing, right? 
and therefore everybody in comparison to that seems I don't know so like free um, but uh, actually all over Europe this progressive social certification after the uh, kind of the uh, flattening of the first couple of centuries of early medieval Europe was was increasing there too so there is um, the progressive um, like this system paradoxically doesn't bring to a, a disgregation like a decentralization of the system this is very important to understand um, that uh, having someone who has more power um, in a certain area that is connected to you is, is a risk in the sense of course that he can um, kind of uh, uh, autonomize himself in some way but at the same time it's, it's way easier to control the territory through him than kind of 100 like him that do not have a, a collective organization and that's why Anglo-Saxon England and its monarchy especially are uh, evolving even on the base of these officials right so it, it's very important to to understand that it, it seems a, like a paradox but high medieval decentralization is is actually a, a pretty damn effective um, gluing system uh, and So this new class of noble provincial thanes at first made up a, uh, a majority of the select third that we have described before. And senior thanes took on a major role in the organization of the third itself uh, in the provinces. Right? They, um, they became essentially organizers and middle-ranking leaders in the same arm. Um, these were essentially officers. They they knew their their business. By by the end of uh, of the Anglo-Saxon period, taints to um, say though still making up the, the backbone of the better trained troops available in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, uh, were also provided and uh, providing an officer class to command provincial levies themselves. And in the 11th century, as we will see now, in a while taints were uh, overshadowed pr pr progressively um, especially during the rule of the Anglo-Danish dynasts by a new class of royal servants that were the ho host carls, right, and uh, were instead of Scandinavian model and, but the, 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 the difference wasn't so dramatic, telling the truth there, there were many similarities between the two models, in many ways the taints basically evolved to host carls themselves. Um, it, at that point, it was rather a matter of where you came from, whether you were an actually an Anglo-Saxon, where you you were Scandinavian. Uh, but um, it, essentially, the role was the same, and, a and, and the same system of uh, the Thanes had produced, in part, uh, the establishment of similar models in that regard from the other side, and um, the. Mm, only the Norman conquest will put an end uh, to both to the to both the Thanes and the Huscarls eventually because they were eradicated and substituted with with other political and, and military models. Now, observing a little better how the select feared evolved during, especially from from the time of Alfred the Great and therefore with the progressive uh, strengthening of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom. So, um, Alfred, uh, ruling famously between 871 and 899, uh, reorganized um, the um, Wessex Select Feared so that it served at only half's strength. Basically, uh, the other half of the troops remained at home to continue with their agricultural uh, business and uh, the second half eventually was to replace the first when their period of service had expired thus theoretically doubling the period for which an army could be maintained in the field at the same time this you could say well okay but they were kind of half of the people yes um, and we can't see particularly well through this but we can uh, imagine at this point that objectively the select feared was actually a pretty heavy military service in in itself like now you know that during alfred's um, uh, kingdom alfred's kingdom they you know they were 
continued there was continuous warfare it was a great problem countering the uh, the Viking uh, incursions and there was a great effort from the side of Anglo Saxons that was partly successful um, and, and uh, so this had even created a problem for the same productivity of Anglo Saxon England leaving aside the the lands that were in the east that were lost effectively to the Scandinavians and the fact that even the Northumbrians didn't like very much Wessex, for example, and it you know decided with the, with, with the Vikings themselves. Um, but it, it's obvious that you know the you know southern England took to the southwestern England took this uh, took this very heavy fort, and um, and and all at once this could cause problems. So it was probably more fitting in that situation to have maybe less troops but more effective and also better supplied in this regard because the other people working at home it's not that they didn't contribute to the military effort they, they were still working the land for providing resources um, and however the you know the actual capacity of Anglo-Saxon kings to, to maintain troops on the field for a long time w wasn't uh, terrific like um, the first part of this uh, th this ha half of the selected fear did, for example, not always wait to be relieved before disbanding. And um, this was normal because actually the uh, supply trains at uh, this time, I mean, yeah, there, there, w there was an effort to coordinate that to build burgs, as we'll see now, that could stock, in fact, even supplies for the military, etc. But you know, once uh, the 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 foot ended, like the army sim simply disbanded itself by by itself. Um, and the first mention of this split third, we can uh, call it, appears under the year 893 in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and it is last mentioned in 920. So possibly wasn't particularly successful, but it also corresponds to that specific time. Um, in Anglo-Saxon history where, you know, that particular military needs had, had occurred. So, the service of the Select Feared was theoretically for a period of 60 days, two months of military service, of campaign, let's say better, and this service was apparently um, not an annual obligation, um, which is, is normal. Right, uh, it was just an obligation in time of war. There, w there was no professionality attached properly to to the general third. Um, so that's a reason for which the same taints weren't technically like properly professionals because these weren't people that, like uh, in in the Frankish world, like f went on campaign like every single year. Uh, because they had a society who could support them in this sense as an elite, and um, and and you know, Frankish chronicles pointing out uh, only those years in which there had not been a military expedition, and not all the times that there was, because it was normal to, to that there had to be an expedition every single year, even more than once. Anglo-Saxon England didn't have anything like this. They didn't have the, the the resources for for achieving that, and and their society was also you know differently um, organized. The wealth was differently distributed, as we have seen, even for kind of the benefit of the individual, but not for the 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 structuring of of, of a collective fort in in that regard. Um, so mm, um, the. Um, there were actually also in Anglo-Saxon England occasions um, of emergency were in which the, the select feared was summoned more than once in a single year, um, read chiefly in a single season, I, I suppose. Um, we're Northern Europe, like so that that that's important. Consider that already like the Franks uh, started their campaigns in Northern France normally uh, in May, whereas uh, south and Italy, the Longobards did in March. So, in climate it is important in this regard. I mean, it, in Northern Europe, you have to consume more resources because it's generally colder, and and therefore it becomes more difficult. These are factors that do matter, right? Um, the mm, uh, Chronicle, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, records the third being called up 
to five times in 1016. That was a pretty intense moment, but um, there was a, an exception, of course, that confirms the rule in many ways. And obviously, um, how did the select feared function in some, such circumstances? Well, um, the, the full service of 60 days was not anticipated on each subsequent summons. And failure to serve usually resulted in a fine of 40 shillings um, for the general feared or and 100 shillings for the select feared. Um, while the t uh, in the case of a t uh, of tains, well, a tain not presenting to you know to to the service could even had his lands confiscated. Hmm? Um, so this speaks actually for the um, like if you hear the the importance of of, of the two types of third is is actually quantified. Like the the select third was considered like to be. Um, 2.5 times more important than the general levy, right? That can speak for quality a little bit. And the taints here uh, are evidently very, very important because they are the guys that uh, have to make this thing function. So if the taint does not organize this locally, not even these, mm, uh, not, all, not, mm, not even the communities can can participate effectively. So. Uh, the Thane was really the guy on, on which kings counted for having their armies fit for for service. Um, desertion naturally could uh, bring to that penalty, um, and especially if the king was present in the army because he was the one who could uh, dispense this. Um, and organization was in shires and later in earldoms. We, we didn't stress this, but it's obvious like there were these repetitions. The elder man was a royal officer, usually of noble blood himself, and uh, served as the king's representative um, in civil matters as well as being a military commander within the shire. And uh, the elder man also typically led the forces of those shires until the reign of, of the Anglo-Danish king Knut between 1016 and 1035 um, and when they were replaced by earls who governed larger territories. Uh, in fact from the reign of Knut uh, the great uh, shires were grouped together both for military and administrative purposes in two small number of larger earldoms. Right, so this actually speaks for a further stratification of society. Now, at this point, you have one single guy that can't keep control of, of these larger districts, so you know that he has the means that in the past centuries, you know, they hadn't had. Uh, as a consequence, earls controlled larger areas and larger forces than elder men, but their role was essentially the same. Hmm? And um, the combination of civil and military roles and the hereditary nature of both kingship and earldoms meant that command might therefore lie with young men uh, with little, little military background and possibly no experience of leadership, right? Though uh, an element of military training would have been standard among uh, young nobles. This is important because naturally you realize that there is an, a natural um, let's say um, detachment from the higher hierarchies, from actual you know um, lower ranks and uh, related military activities, like the first Anglo-Saxons who invaded Britain were actual warriors sent for sent. Uh, at this point, they are kind of like uh, privileged aristocrats, you know, spoiled and whatever. That they, they knew their business. As, as fighters as well, but it was a very different background um, from the ones of their ancestors 500 years before. Um, so this, this is important as well because um, it, it's a, you, it, there is also a difference here between the Frankish model that actually entailed probably a higher level of, of, of 
military skills, individually speaking, um, even if it's debatable, actually, I'm not completely sure if there's actually, I don't think there is any way to, to measure it, but it's obvious that um, Anglo-Saxon England as such doesn't develop the same level of military professionalism that the Frankish world did, and it's partly perhaps why even they, they lost at Hastings uh, in that regard. I mean, I don't want to make it a deterministic event because I don't believe in, in, in such things, but um, it's obvious that you have uh, at that point a Norman that is essentially a Frank Western Frankish model, political military model that effectively wins over the Anglo-Saxons, but at the same time, yeah, the, the, the Anglo-Saxons could technically make it as well. But probably also evolving themselves, as we have noticed before, towards, a, and as we'll see better now, towards a more professional uh, orientation, let's say. Um, and naturally, kings led armies in battle, like kings had their, you know, they were legitimized partly in their uh, political authority, it, through military success, I mean, they had to prove to, to defend their community in arms, and that that's the single most important thing that a king has to do. He has to be an effective political, hence political equates military, by definition, ruler, right? Um, so, as well as third service, other military obligations involved... Um, for example, work upon bridges and fortresses, sometimes uh, even dismantling those of the enemy. We know that the Anglo-Saxons were, you know, pretty active to counter uh, Scandinavian raids by building all these um, fortified burghs that had to be even garrisoned and um, that was re required, at least in some regions, right, and Two related documents record that an acre's breadth of wall should be maintained and manned by 16 heights, right? Each height represented by one man. Thinking also about Offa's Dyke uh, with um, the border with Wales, right? It is pretty similar also to the uh, Danevirk in, uh, in, in southern Denmark, right? So there were these major kind of uh, heartworks and palisades that were built to, for extended, that were actually a system of, for the, this stuff you can't be found easily, even uh, think about the the locks in, uh, on the alpine passes and the, the, the were scattered in in, um, in early medieval Europe and they were more a set of a of, of constructions of, of, of fortifications etc connected to ditches, palisades and, and so on, uh, things like that, but this stuff was effective as long as it was manned, right? And it was often the same army, actually, aside from the regular local garrisons that rendered these um, fortifications effective because local garrisons couldn't stem a, a major invasion, right? So, but they had to be kept fit, even just structurally, um, in uh, in peacetime as well, for further, in case of further war. Um, and garrison duty, um, uh, and by the way, these 16 heights uh, represented 16 men, so one height per man in that specific case, and the reason being that the service was local, right, differently from the feared height system um, that I think overlapped as well. I don't think that, I mean, there were sure, surely exemptions, like, you know, if you participated to this um, wall a military garrison, like you, you had to. Uh, maybe you you were exempted from from participating in the theater, but sometimes were maybe the same thing. Anyhow, um, garrison duty uh, was evidently carried out in loco, so people actually lived and served in the same place. Hence, uh, the incidence, uh, like the amount of 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 service required. Uh, per height was higher, all right, because it was less demanding, uh, economically speaking. Um, and as we were saying before, garrison duty appears to have exempted those who took part from third service, but not all times, right? And it's obvious that in case of you know of actual emergency, at that point everybody could be mobilitated. In addition to the third levies, 
Anglo-Saxon kings and noblemen were accompanied from the earliest times by personal retinues or bodyguards of warriors. And we've seen before where that this is ideally where the Thanes actually emerged from, but there were other troops known as the Herd Troop or the Herd. These warriors were essentially uh, that they became over time actually lesser noblemen themselves and known uh, success, uh, successively as earls, right? Um, Jesuits or, or Thanes from the 8th to 11th centuries. Um, we have seen how these uh, kind of roles are f complicated. Um, and it seems that there was also a. Um, I think a, a subdivision that I don't think I don't know how formal it really was. It was probably just um, practical, that more than else. Also, because it was these were kind of personal retinues, right? And they were the dagod um, that were the veterans essentially, and the uh, geogods, the young, inexperienced warriors. So this actually reflects the ancient um, tribal war bands uh, cycles of uh, training based on age and experience etc so uh, it was normal for these uh, military units that evolved in fact as bodyguards actually from from war bands um, to to be kind of mm, kind of standing troops right because differently from the third these guys were always around the uh, the noble uh, the the king's household um, in the nobleman's household, and they were maintained by them just as a security force, uh, etc. And, and naturally, there was a cyclicity in the way, I mean, younger elements joined, other older warriors kind of, um, yeah, they probably remained up to their death or how much they, they could they could f be, you know, fighting effective, but not, not only because they had also other roles and tasks, but eventually they died naturally, also in combat. So this uh, repetition is kind of natural. Um, and those noblemen who served in the king's retinue were distinguished as king's thanes. And these king, uh, the king often supplied with equipment, armor, and weapons as gifts, though they were returned on the retainer's debt unless he died in battle, upon which they passed to his family. This is very interesting because it shows you the typical a tribal tradition of chieftains to, in fact, basically seize the loot and eventually redistributing it to their own warriors. That was a matter of, um, like, this was an insurance for the same uh, retinue because obviously, you know, the, the more, like, chieftains were um, joined by, the, by these retinues, ideally, initially, by their own effectiveness, right? So the, the better this guy was... Uh, as a warrior and as as a commander, uh, the more you could loot together with him, and the, the better he he could reward you, right? And the interesting thing is that for keeping these guys loyal further, um, they uh, they knew. I mean, that they, they could have these weapons, but in case of death, um, these weapons could pass to their family, which very likely was tied, clientally speaking, <laughs> to uh, to to the king. Uh, the noblemen already, uh, so this entailed maybe that the, I don't know, maybe the the, the Tain's, um son was already part of the same retinue, and he, uh, at his father's that he would inherit uh, in battle. I mean, he would inherit his his weaponry, right? So this was a way to naturally uh, structure, like keeping glued these elements to. To, to read in terms of royalty, uh, loyalty, uh, etc. Um, this practice was known as the Harriet, that was still in existence, in fact, in, in the tent in the 11th centuries. Like, this didn't quite end. Like, it was something you can't find even uh, in feudal times later on. It was always in, in the same way. This way of um, unofficial, um, let's say private, this, this is a typically privatistic. Uh, mindset and culture of rewarding the the fate the personally faithful right and that has nothing to do at this point with the with the public side of the story uh, that is technically the feared as such um, it, it's really a personal relation 
Uh, a 10th century source records the Harriet of an elderman uh, as four swords, four bearnets that are corselets, essentially, um, and four helmets, four saddles and traps, uh, trappings, eight horses, eight spears, and eight shields, plus four gold armbands. Right? Um, the time in the time of Knut the Great, the Harriet of Attain consisted of a horse, saddle, sword, spear, helmet, shield, and burning, or an amount of gold. Right? Uh, this is very important because you will see now what, what we have observed. Further, I would like to add, and a king stained four times as much than this except for saddles and swords of which two were required. Um, and these numbers can be taken essentially as a, as a average Harriet. Now the interesting thing about this is, is two. Like the first one is you notice that from the, t uh, from the 10th to the 11th century there is a, um, uh, a more direct, uh, like there, there is a mm, a permutation of a certain amount of weaponry with gold, right? And this could be as well the fact that Knut the Great was freaking rich, like because he namely ruled effectively over Denmark, Norway, and England. Um, so, and we can naturally think that also in the 10th century you could, you know, pay your personal retinue uh, with with money rather than weaponry. Right. The second thing, which is pretty amazing, which always interests me, is actually the presence of the saddle as uh, part of the Harriet, right? which proves, if in any case that there was any doubt in this regard, of the presence of cavalry in Anglo-Saxon armies, which is something that is usually not denied, but saying, like, these guys just, you know, went um, to war, um, for like uh, on horseback, then that is mounted to fight on foot. We we know this happened in certain battles. Even uh, we we know that uh, the Anglo-Saxon commanders took all the horse uh, in the rear. For uh, the the ideal was you know avoiding foot troops. In fact, to, I mean troops to ex to escape uh, being on foot. And we we should make a massive video about this topic because actually I think that Anglo-Saxons made uh, use of cavalry in combat. Uh, maybe not as much as you know the most developed um, uh, are such as uh, you know the, those armies that had m more radically developed cavalry during the the ninth the tenth century the eleventh century but still they they did use it in combat and that there is um, an awareness in anglo saxon England even of of the most advanced cavalry tactics that were pioneered in um for example, I don't know, in Ottonian Germany, we, we find the same exact tactics used by Henry I of Germany at Belvriad against the Magyars, um, repeated in the Anglo-Saxon poem Maxim uh, I of, of, of the 10th century as well, that actually talks to you about this, technically it was like a shield wall, uh, shield wall on horseback, that by the way is witnessed among the Germanic peoples since the Byzantine Strategicon of the 6th century, so there is actually, and there are lots of other informations. If you really scratch um, the the surface of sources uh, about Anglo-Saxon cavalry, but I promise we will talk about this on another occasion. Always given for granted that, of course, the Anglo-Saxons did use cavalry, and they did use it in combat. Surely, Britain wasn't, um, you know, a great deal for horse breeding at the time. They surely had problems in, you know, probably in the, the having. The, the stuff in quantity, but we, we do know they used that. They, they used it as much as the Scandinavians did it, so I don't think there is any other way. And naturally, even especially with the contacts um, during the 11th century, the intense contacts with the with the Normans of, um, I mean, the Normans of Normandy proper, uh, this thing had spread. And we, we know that there was actual Norman cavalry in Anglo-Saxon England before the Norman conquest, of course. It's pretty famous in that um, the Anglo-Saxons could adapt their forces to to cavalry combat as well in, in, in ways that weren't just about like 
pitch battles, but even kind of scary because Harold uh, Harold Godwinson did use that, for example, against the Welsh. Um, maybe not with the utmost success, but still, you know, aside from that, he had been fighting in the same Normandy, in typical um, Norman fashion, by the way. So, you know, that's not something that the Anglo-Saxons didn't know how to do. It's simply that their society was different from the Frankish one. It was r literally a matter of land distribution, probably strictly of environmental problems for horse breeding, but Anglo-Saxon cavalry was there. And um, even if, you know, there are certain sources that suggest that, that it was kind of used in different ways, it's a, it's, we, we don't, we don't believe that because there is no reason, to, no valid reason to do it in the first place. But I promise I will make a video on this specifically. Um, at, at one point, um, the, um, before we talked about the elder men, well, as we've seen, this was se senior to the king's tain proper. Uh, this is important to remember because the tain was, as we've seen, technically like a retinue, hence conceptually a servant. It's not very different from the Carolin uh, from the Frankish uh, familia, for example. That is literally the family uh, or uh, or the house carl, right? The the man of the house, literally speaking, because it literally lived with with the lord in his. Uh, household. Um, but the elder man was, was a upper class in this sense to the king's tain and um, because he was technically an upper class tain himself living on his own estate rather than serving in the king's retinue. This is very important because the difference in here is made by the land you own and the fact that you do not belong to that clientele. You don't have that specific bond. So Naturally, the, uh, owning that land equated to a certain degree of autonomization by itself and direct um, control on your military instrument. And during the 9th and the 10th centuries, the title of elder man gradually gave way to the Scandinavian Jarl. Uh, that was uh, essentially the, the equivalent of the Anglo-Saxon Earl, or Earl, right? So before we pass to mercenary troops um, proper, I would like to go a bit more in depth to the household troops proper in the Anglo-Saxon army, known as the Hearth Veru, right? Um, so the, uh, the the weapon of the like the the army of of the heart, right? Meaning as the uh, lifeguard, the, the bodyguard in that sense. And as we have observed, this was essentially a separate warrior elite that we know um, it, it belonged actually to the to the Anglo-Saxon chieftains at the moment of their migration in, in Brit to Britain already. The king or leader or a tribe in fact surrounded himself with loyal followers and companions who would protect him and be the means by which he imposed his will over the local population. I mean, this was really the brutal force. These guys were the, uh, the they were bands of tags. I, I'm not, I'm not kidding. We have seen before, like armies of sixty people. What do you think these people looked like originally? I don't know, in in the fifth or in the sixth century, right? Um, and these guys were originally selected um, out of the general masses. Uh, you know, I mean, in early Anglo-Saxon times, literally for their strictly combative capabilities, we can think. Of course, it was uh, that was not the only factor, but that was a time in which you really needed like strong, tough men who could literally chop to pieces where you found in front of yours uh, that wanted to kill you in turn, by the way. And so, over time, uh, these people naturally became rather... Uh, associated with a higher political and social st status, um, but they definitely man did maintain their nature of full-time warriors, right? Naturally with kind of an elite character still, and as we've seen also with roles of coordination of the same lesser troops. 
right? After all, these were veterans, so that's who you want to entrust the the control of your army to. Even just think about I don't know when when this army is kind of formed, their formation. Think about the pig snout right? that the the same Anglo-Saxons, for example, sometimes used effectively against the the Vikings that are stereotypically thought of the you to to make use of that. I mean, you you need someone who actually knows how to order the ranks. You don't deploy troops like just randomly. You you don't. These were, by the way, armies that largely fought uh, kind of kind of one in front of the other and frontally and with shock force and cohesion of the front rank of shield walls. Uh, and and that was essentially by that. And by the way, shield walls. It's a, it's there's a concept I hate because literally every single you know uh, trained army in in uh, in uh, these times is, is fighting like that. Like, you, how much do you want to fight? Of course, there are troops. For example, the early Anglo-Saxons were seemingly less... They had looser formations in general. They were, they were kind of even lighter. They had smaller shields. They were probably much more hit-and-run tactics than, they, than even than other Germans on average. Uh, because they were kind of poorer and they they had less collective training so the, the the individual side of the story was more important over time these guys of course increased their even their wealth their, their strength their armor etc so they um as as an army they they tend to stick more together with uh, closed ranks etc and uh, clashing against but you know everybody used shield wall historically speaking like it's not a big deal no, like of course there are certain troops that are more inclined and actually troops who use shield walls are technically um, uh, on average less um, probably less elite than than we can think right you know the in fact the same concept of pig snout is that you have a, a triangle of warriors that more than being a shield wall it attacks like all combat yes but chiefly with this idea of smashing frontally like an individual like um so normally the the feared was trained to, to fight like capable of, of being arrayed like that we know it from the strate uh, strategicon of the 6th century um Saudo Mauritius that you know Germanic peoples fought like this like also others did but aside from this the, I, I will not descend into the because we will have to make a video about this as well this video is not about tactics as you understand it's merely about the uh, organization of the Anglo-Saxon army um, you know and so these units had also to be um, organized by by people who had a considerable military experience hence these professionals or semi-professionals of war that knew even how to arrange the ranks to to guide the troops at the same units by the way and even to intervene as a as a reserve as some sort of you know um core picked troops that theoretically here is is conceived to fight to the death because these guys have a, a reputation like it they, they don't follow the um they they, f they follow their chieftains chiefly because of of the material advantage but together with that culturally speaking it goes all uh an ethos that is like fanatically oriented towards like you know if my lord dies i I have to be dead first before him because that's literally my task. And if I want to make a career, that's what I have to be ready to do. And and we know that this is something that actually existed even in pre, in pre Roman, in pre Roman Britain, for example, or even the same among the Romano Britons. Like there were big troops that that's what I have to do, technically speaking. Um, so. The the house, household troops naturally uh, were privileged uh, in the sense they spent great part of their time uh, exercising their skills of arms. Right? They they devoted great part of their life to this, and that's why they were effectively professionals. Right? Naturally, and especially in early Anglo-Saxon England, there weren't you know these great powers for which they they had such enormous occasions to 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 meet, I don't know, to organize, how, uh, you know, to, to fight in who knows which big 
units for which who knows which collective training they had uh, but definitely f for early medieval standards were some of the toughest troops around and they they were a uh, considerable force on the field as we have seen the uh, king's personal bodyguards were were the best ones and uh, they were known in in old english as the hearth bearer which literally means the hearth guard in the early and middle uh, anglo-saxon periods um, it would seem from the scanty source material available that these household warriors made up the bulk of the forces fielded by any ambitious king or lord there is this fragmentary poem of the fight at Finsburg, Finsburg actually, uh, which takes place in the fifth century. Right, it, it, one of the armies contains only sixty warriors, as we were saying before, and the forces brought across from the continent by the earliest of the fifth century Anglo-Saxon kings uh, are said, in fact, to have been carried. Um, by tiny numbers of ships, typically three to, f to five, so this couldn't be more than, uh, you know, than a couple of hundred men, right? So it, it that gives you a dimension. It, it was these retinues, effectively, uh, that uh, we can intend at that point more like that picked troops, more like war bands, properly that were armies on their own in fact that they weren't elite like there was an elite within the same war band but the war band was a kind of autonomous um, uh, also political unit we could say not just military one they they were technically self-sufficient or at least as we know they lived off the the, the land uh, especially during the phase of conquest etc and and these were essentially uh, the the people who were to become like the like these bands were ruled by those leaders who would become the founders of, of the future Anglo-Saxon dynasties themselves. Um, and these elite warrior bands were, however, not exclusively, re uh, exclusively restricted to the service of a king. For example, the Aetheling, uh, which means the noble this prince, let's say, Guthlach of Mercia, Mercia, uh, raised an independent band of followers in the 7th century and proceeded to lay waste the lands and strongholds of his enemies over a period of nine years. Uh, like, this is, this really gives you an idea of how it really was. I mean, the, the, the concept of bands, the, you know, these kings could technically send um, such troops even, you know, in aid of someone else, or maybe instead of training them in their household, they, they sent them raiding someone's place, like, you know, that was a pretty effective way of training them, and to even show the the actual long-range capabilities sometimes of these bands that, that kind of roamed around, sometimes here, it says, for nine years, we get how many places, probably they, they, they fought, and um, and that it's interesting because in the case of Guthlach of Mercia, at no point uh, did he make any pretense of acting on behalf of the king of Mercia himself. So it's um, it, this speaks really for the degree of uh, you know of the lack, let's say, better, of central authority in early Anglo-Saxon England. It, ha it tells you how fluid that was. These were literally tens and tens of small kingdoms that you know had a pretty loose political consistency as such and sometimes these bands could really make the difference at that point in founding for example a kingdom on their own uh, the army which Penda of Mercia took on his final campaign against Oswey of Northumbria in 655 was said to number 30 legions as uh, it is said and um, this naturally is uh, classicism that has, however, nothing to do with the actual number of Roman legions that were, like in, ra in late Roman times, objectively they were kind of smaller, they were roughly 1,000 men, or even less, technically. Um, so we don't know how, how much that was. Um, 
More probably, we're really talking about small personal bodyguards that um, of various kings and lords that were allied to Penn in that case, and uh, we can legitimately suggest that such units could not individually have um, counted more than a few hundred men, and most would have been smaller still, right? In 685, the exiled noble Said Valla, although uh, a fugitive outlaw, managed to overthrow King Santwin, Santwine, I think, of Wessex in battle. Said Valla would have had difficulty raising a large number of troops, which suggests that the control of the, in of the entire kingdom of Wessex was decided by a battle between, in fact, two small army, rather small armies. In the earliest compilation of English law, uh, the code of King Ine of Wessex, written down about 694 that we have met before, uh, defines an army, here, as uh, that was what said in old English at the time, any group that counted more than 35 armed men. <laughs> so, this is, this is pretty meaningful. So, actually those legions, right, that were counted um, under uh, command of Pend of Mercia actually could be as much as maybe 1,000 people, literally. Um, therefore, you, you can imagine what, what the general picture actually uh, was um, and uh, who composed these guys in er early Anglo-Saxon times? Well, you know, many of these regiments might have been composed even by better equipped and motivated seals, for example. Um, even though most of these troops were, in all likelihood, the yes, it has um, the the companions of the king, right, and the ancestors of Thanes, as we have seen seen before. Now, I would like to talk about the, the last and probably also kind of, I don't know whether more or less fascinating, but definitely very interesting part um, of the uh, late Anglo-Saxon period. And first of all, talking about mercenaries, right, um, of throughout all the period. And we know the Anglo-Saxon armies um, made use of consistent amount of mercenaries. Um, Welshmen, for example, are occasionally mentioned in this context, um, but definitely with the, the Viking era, the Scandinavian troops provided the bulk of Anglo-Saxon mercenaries. Um, we know that large numbers of Vikings were employed under Ethelred the Unready, uh, under such notable leaders as Olaf uh, Tryggvason and the Yums. Uh, Viking uh, Thorkel the Tall. The Yom's uh, Viking were essentially um, Vikings were an order of Viking mercenaries or brigands, which basically means literally the same thing at this point uh, between the the tenth and, and the eleventh century. And the word is um, kind of associations and kind of like orders, like conceptually speaking, those. Um, Retinues we were talking about, the, those hurt very were, were, yeah, in that case, the worst. I mean, these units were always commanded by a chieftain that had the level of charisma and prestige and, and, and skill, like, but sometimes there were deeper religious motivation, especially from the Viking side, like Anglo Saxon England was a bit more secular and, uh, and advanced, but in, in the Scandinavian world, there were all these still very savage and um, fanatic units of um, religious devotees that were all about, you know, bloodshed, uh, martyrs, uh, you know, raid and glory, etc. And, and that was functional to their culture, to their society, because it, it was uh, that, that the environment where they, they came from required them to have that level of of ferocity, of toughness, of cohesion that Otherwise, they could have not gotten from the local political and social structures. And these guys sold their service. I mean, there was an evolution, of, of course, also in Scandinavian, uh, Scandinavian um, uh, 
you know, in, during the Viking era, um, towards the, this model, actually, the Scandinavian period dramatically accelerates the stratification of the otherwise pretty, you know, flat and egalitarian Scandinavian society. I mean, always relatively, because, you know, aristocracies were present always also there, but... Um, the, wh when we think about Vikings, we're not thinking about the most traditional elements of their society, because technically, their society was about you know being all ca more or less free and equal. And these Vikings who took the sea, or guys who were extremely dangerous for that social order, because they came back with an enormous amount of wealth with which they could uh, inflate their retinues and take over, uh, you know, in fact, the, fr the freedom of other communities. So. Actually, Scandinavia, the Viking era is, is very controversial and thought-provoking in that regard. And these were pretty fine warriors, and that's why they, they had this success and were hired by the same Anglo-Saxons, even if, of course, we have to stress that um, Anglo-Saxon England was partly, literally conquered by these people, so rather than being strictly mercenaries, sometimes they were just, you know, maybe undesired hosts, than, rather than being, um, you know, fought against, they were hired, and therefore contained in uh, in, in this regard. So think about the Danegeld, uh, for instance. Um, there were mm, Scandinavian mercenaries from the side of the Anglo-Saxons at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Right, so there were Scandinavians um, in the Anglo-Saxon army fighting against the Norwegians. And Possibly there were Danes, even in the Anglo-Saxon army at Hastings, in, um, after a few a few months. So that that's quite meaningful. Literally, by 1066, England is, if I, I mean, is technically Anglo-Danish, uh, right? So th th there is a pretty heavy blend at that point, and this is very evident, especially in political as well as military culture. The most famous of all the Viking mercenaries uh, were definitely the Huskarls, that were a bit like the, the Hertvero, conceptually speaking. These were a permanent body of royal household troops um, based uh, on the young uh, Vikings and living by a strict military code, as we've seen. Uh, Flatir uh, Jarbok claims that Swain Forkbeard introduced these troops into England prior to his death in 1014. Even if they might have actually existed in Anglo-Saxon service um, late in Hethelred's reign in the form of the contingents of Torkel the Tall and others. So you realize how mixed and fluid these uh, record like these employment hiring and employment systems were these troops were divided in two corps that were based in London and an unknown northern side called Slesvik um, that is thought to be in New Yorkshire other Scandinavian sources however record that Knut the Great was responsible for the introduction of the Huskarls, probably in 1018 uh, 18 circa. Later uh, Danish chroniclers such as Sven Agesson and Saxo Grammaticus record the strengths of the Huskarls at 3,000 and 6,000 men respectively. Um, interestingly, Saxo uh, states that the Huskarls, in this case, were distributed among 60 ships, therefore, from his side, probably like 100 men per ship. And probably Sven um, Agassen is more correct, since he uh, states that um, those uh, 3,000 men were um, carried um, by uh, by forty ships, uh, by Knut in ten eighteen, and therefore um, that would count as much as seventy five men per ship, uh, which is kind of more accurate. But you know we are still in the field of uh, I think of suggestions. There was naturally a multitude of bands of this kind, 
together with the herdmen and other Scandinavian mercenaries, there were, for example, the the Litzman, the Butzkarls. Well, these all fit largely in the Huskarls, uh, more generally, right? And probably the most important thing about this in Anglo-Saxon England, though, is how they were sustained, right? Uh, famously by the Danegeld, or Herregeld, the so-called army tax, right? Or out of the Danish tax that... Um, was levied at a rate of one to shillings on, on the hide. Uh, this tax was introduced famously in 1012, um, eventually abolished in 1015, and uh, in apparently further reintroduced late during the reign of Edward the Confessor uh, between uh, 1042 and 1066. There were also additional payments uh, coming from special taxes um, that were specifically designed for the payment of mercenaries. Um, fines uh, for failure to serve in, in the third as well, but also voluntary payments um, in lieu of military service that uh, in post-Norman conquest um, would become known as the scutage, right? Um, th this is mm, important because it shows you that there is um, an increase in military professional, uh, professionalism from actually foreign troops that are hired by the at, at the highest levels of Anglo-Saxon England, um, politically and socially. More people who basically don't want to participate to the third, and all of the interest of the ruling class to actually cash rather than oblige people to go fight for them. So, like, in other historical contexts, this is really not a, a particularly good picture um, on the state of, of local, uh, you know, more than military, actually, of, of strictly political and social affairs. Like, there is um, uh, an impoverishment of, of, of the freemen, um, a certification of society. This, however, c does correspond to, uh, in part, probably, like, it would be interesting to discuss this, to, to a better military organization that, however, was a bit, you know, had been evolving that direction since the beginning, right? So I don't know how much the things could be really, could be really changed, but th this should be observed also under the light of the actual institutional story of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom, and now we, we don't have time to, to talk about it. Um, talking more specifically about the host cars a little bit, um, these were at first usually near the king. Uh, albeit, for example, by 1066 they were supported uh, sometimes by grants of land upon which they might reside. So, in turn, there was sedentarization of these individuals as well. Essentially, the Vikings were doing the same thing that the Anglo-Saxons had done before, right? So, all of that impulse that they had in their migration set was, was aimed at, you know, getting, you know, settling down either, you know, uh, in, in Scandinavia itself up with the, the fruit of their raids or even overseas as, you know, Rollo in Normandy uh, proves. So all this contributed to, to that progressive stratification, right, and to that privatization of Anglo-Saxon institutional culture that in a certain sense did pave the way for the Norman conquest that at that point was, was seen as, in fact as a private business. William the Conqueror, as you said before, actually seized the Anglo-Saxon kingdom by saying, this is my land, and this is my personal thing, Th this is not, the, the, you, you have been conquered, so I rule in here. Th this is literally how, how it went I at the beginning. And Edward the Confessor used the Huskarls as, as garrison troops at strategic points, for example, uh, which means that these troops were essentially becoming, instead of the local Anglo-Saxon levies, the the uh, and you know um, hierarchical system of the thanes, etc. What really made the difference in terms even of territorial dominations and control over the kingdom, and 
um, the during um, Edward the Confessor's reign, um, the greater earls had began to imitate as well the royal bodyguard by raising their own bodies of host carls. So that was very risky because you realize that those uh, earls that had that those greater er, uh, greater earls that uh, that had served to the same structuring of the kingdom now were essentially becoming um, eligible candidates like for you know competing with royal power as well and this was a problem in terms exactly of strictly territorial control because it was a matter of fact of how many resources you could control throughout the kingdom and you know how could you do that if one earl effectively control it by itself and used it by the way to maintain his own troops it was all like that right it was like that also in Normandy when there weren't many differences at that point any m much more let's say um in a certain measure, in terms of maybe of even a mindset of privatization, still Anglo-Saxon England was different from the continent, but I think that the gaps was closing. Um, Earl Tostig is recorded to have had 200 of his Huskars killed by Northumbrian rebels in 1065, while others escaped alive, suggesting that you know this unit had a minimal strength of at least like. 250, 300, which is not a few, right? And uh, the royal Huskarls probably were like three or 4,000 strong, right? So you, you see, they're, they're not immense numbers, but think that these are actually picked troops. Um, so they are, I mean, there is naturally a, a probably also, you know, a segmentation within these units as well. That were probably like an army on its own. Uh, but it was somewhat larger. These were strictly professionals, wh which makes a, a great deal of difference. And in fact, the the the, the royal Huskars were properly the nucleus of the royal army proper, and uh, they were vital even for improving the morale and bolstering of the fair levies proper. That uh, at that point also probably didn't stand much of a chance against these guys, as you know the, the same uh danishization i don't know how to say that of, of anglo-saxon england had had proven in in some way um as we've seen before armies were generally led then by the king himself otherwise by this deputy usually an earl or man or an earl though even sometimes a bishop and there were mm, there is evidence, even of one occasion, which the army refused to fight um, and even disbanded because the king was not present on the field. So that's important because you know there was always a good excuse to you know to disband an army uh, from from who, you know the perspective of those who participated at large. But definitely the presence of the king on, on the battlefield was very important for in the Anglo-Saxon political and military ethos. Like, it was seen, like, if, you know, if my king is not here, what, what am I fighting for? Where's my, uh, you know, where's the guy that's supposed to, to care for this all and to, to effectively lead it, right? And uh, who are we fighting for? Um, in later times, an earl would lead a force composed of uh, the thirds from several shires, as we've seen, each commanded by its own uh, Shire Reeve, and this retinue of um, Huskarls attached. Right. And talking about the Huskarls, because I think it's, uh, again, insisting on them, it's um, it's important to stress this period because this uh, of their affirmation, because we are effectively in the final 50 years of Anglo-Saxon England proper. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's very important that... Um, at 50 years of the Norman, from the Norman conquest, a model was in part similar to the same Norman tradition, aside from you know the natural differences that existed between Frankish, uh, the Frankish Normans proper, and the Scandinavians. It, it, this cannot be you know bypassed. But let's say it 
uh, it, it actually goes in parallel with the same normal political penetration in England. Like, as we know, you know, even Edward the Confessors had pretty strong ties in that regard with the continent, and um, the, the there was um, kind of there was a testing of the Anglo-Saxon ground for for the Normans in their their intelligence to to know what what this world was like. They knew each other pretty well. They were technically becoming the same thing already before the conquest by many standards. There was all this great, uh, let's say, shared northern world throughout the, the, the Channel, the, the North Sea, even partly the Balt Baltic Sea. Um, and, um, and the Normans of Normandy did retain some you know, important connections with this world as well, albeit they were become they had become already something different from this kind of other northerners. The Oscarl uh, itself uh, is conceptually of Scandinavian origin, like the term is as we've seen household men, warrior making up the household troops of a ruler. Um there was no substantial difference, uh, as we've seen, between the Uskarl and the Artver of the Anglo-Saxon courts. Uh, both had their ultimate origin in the board bodyguard units of Germanic kings, and their roles were the same. They were literally the same. Um, the first reference to the Uskarls of England, specifically, appears in late Icelandic um, sources, uh, namely the, the Flatte Jarbok that we mentioned before, and um, and that's where we have seen they 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 were said to have been brought to England by Swain Forkbird of Denmark sometimes around the the tenth the first ten of uh, of the eleventh century. Um, there are other notes from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that talks about uh, Knut armies um, this me uh, this this bandment in 1018 that told us that he he maintained eventually these troops those um, crews of 40 ships as household uh, soldiers um, we know that Knut had ruled England since 1014 and um, these his Huskarls were in the sense trusted men veterans of of many battles, and naturally they they took over positions that in in uh, that had been held by Anglo -Sax the Anglo Saxons uh, in the royal household, right? So there was an actual physical su so substitution of the previous clientels under the time of uh, Knut's reign over England, and later on, uh, Scandinavians and Anglo Saxons were however recruited into the host cars without distinction of race right they um after all the you know there weren't many differences in that specific regard too i mean the norse and the english were pretty similar after all and uh they had shared so much in the last centuries i mean in terms of the, the viking era as we know was a terrible hybridizer i don't know how to call this of political military cultures, the uh, this Danes had settled in 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 Britain as well. So um, they were actually very close, and that's why actually it, it's interesting to see that Anglo-Saxon England during the Viking era was brought kind of a bit more within the broader Scandinavian world, and that's why eventually William the Conqueror's invasion is something very p particular because paradoxically those were descendants in part of Nor other Normans that now they were substantially French in literally in every single damn thing and therefore the, the Norman conquest of England was essentially attaching England to to the continent, uh, to, to the Frankish world, let's say um, in a way that would change European world history forever and this had a weight in uh, you know, in, in in the direction that that many things could have could have taken. Maybe we should make a video that you. I never made a what if video, but I think it's fascinating to think what what if the Anglo Saxons had actually crushed the Normans at Hastings. That that would be very interesting to to guess. <laughs>
um, surely Anglo-Saxon England would have been conceived today way more similar to the northern, like to the Scandinavian countries that, than it is today, which is something objectively substantially different by many, many points of view. Now, the host corals, um, as we've seen, performed much the same duties also as, as the king's stains, right? They could be allocated administrative tasks by the king and could even be landholders, much like the provincial thanes. And host cars were also found in the households of great lords, such as the brothers of Harold Godwinson, uh, Leofwine, and, and, and Geert. Um, so, um, you understanding here that th they were technically uh, perfectly integrated at every level in Anglo Saxon society. And this. Um, Huskars would have served, in fact, in the royal army when required, um, and that can easily be seen. Uh, for example, from the the last stand uh, alongside Leofwein and Gert in the Bayeux tapestry itself. So even the Normans at that point acknowledged the importance of Huskars in, in the Anglo-Saxon society at the point of picturing that as effectively, you know, an Anglo-Saxon army. That uh, that is, uh, you know, the arm of of of, of the, the English people in that sense, um, but with the the finest troops actually represented by the host cars as kind of a. At that point, you can't say a foreign element, but something that had affirmed itself just in the last two generations. That that's important to remember. Um, the Domesday Book. By the way, in Norman times, records the house uh, house carls as landholders after they ceased to be a military force as well. So these guys had also taken roots in, you know, as landowners fundamentally. Um, regarding their payment, we we don't know if they actually were paid regular salaries um, because simply we don't have the sources to to prove that. But it's it's likely, right? It, um, it's possible, of course, that they were rewarded in a somewhat more similar way that, uh, like in the Harriet fashion, that was pretty, you know, much more practiced in Scandinavia than than in Anglo-Saxon England at that point. But we, we can't easily think they were paid also regularly uh, at some level, especially at the highest levels. Um, and surely we we know because the, the, there was uh, all of a pretty fluid and pretty l regular market of these troops as well. So um, there was an increase in, in the numbers of horse cars that were actually raised by the same royal households by the 11th century. So this was a system that went on you know, in a pretty fluid and regular fashion, uh, re in regularized fashion by that point. And so. All hints suggest that, especially in the second half of the eleventh century, like also for other European standards, yeah, I mean th there was surely a regular payment that maybe could be in form of of natural goods. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, but also with land chiefly because that's what what it meant. Like, but um, these troops were probably also becoming ever more uh, independent on on their own from from the their employers in terms of the way they. They equipped themselves, for example. In 1094, uh, King William Rufus summoned the third of the Anglo-Norman kingdom now. And, uh, and this is interesting because this um, army was meant to serve overseas. Right? Yet, it was disbanded before... Uh, the crossing of the channel and King Rufus actually extracted from each Dane 10 shillings uh, instead of service fundamentally so this is pretty meaningful now I, I don't know the, the technicalities of these whether this might have been a negotiation gone wrong like maybe uh, yeah, we don't know about the decisional processes what was the strategical situation and now in detail don't, don't ask me but um, it's kind of you know what did you make them move for if eventually they 
they had to, to pay instead of serving like but this is pretty meaningful because it still shows you that um that th there was a, an actual practice of monetization but more than that this money seems to have rep this specific one uh, in, in this occasion seems to have represented part of 20 shillings that is 4 pence per day that is the one required by the Berkshire Domesday entry that we have read at the beginning of the video to be provided for each member of the third to maintain uh, himself while on service for the two months stated by law as we have seen and in 1094 this money seems to have been used to pay for 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 other merc for mercenaries proper that were in fact becoming a prominent feature of European warfare at the time uh, and with a very you know intense future ahead under that regard all right uh, so I think this was a good beginning on Anglo-Saxon warfare and this I hope I was clear and naturally probably I said I, I mispronounced a lot of stuff so I'm I, I'm actually realizing just right now that I've been talking to a public of essentially you know a lot largely as, as, as far as I understand from YouTube analytics already you know English mother language if not actually you know British people who, who surely know that, that this history hold by heart so I don't pretend to have added anything specifically new or thought-provoking to what is already largely known about the system that by the way compared to other European realities is not dramatically documented so I'm not saying there is a few to know but you know generally who deals with this topics knows that the, the general availability of sources is not very very high um, but I think it was very interesting and naturally we didn't see in detail every single um, change that occurred in this process. Maybe we'll have to make more detailed videos explaining properly every single kind of change and mutation and because th these are 500 years they're not just um, a couple of centuries so a lot of things change. We passed technically to from migration era um, tribesmen to the professionalism of the um, 11th century um, Anglo-Saxon how um, royal host cars right so it's a you know it's a pretty impressive but you you get the advancement uh, the, adv the advancement in there but at the same time the crisis I think this is something I had um, never thoroughly considered and maybe I, I will like to expand further on because uh, effectively we do know a few but all the the uh, indications we find here actually speak in, in to me about not much of a military but rather a political crisis right that of course reflects itself in the, from the military point of view but that you know mm, okay history cannot be told deterministically speaking I don't believe in it but let's say that it would have been all <laughs> very interesting to see how Anglo-Saxon society would have evolved without the Norman conquest and yet we have to observe what what is here but um, it's obvious that the, the more let's say it's obvious that the popular participation of the Anglo-Saxon people proper to the army is something that was lost definitely by the time of the Norman conquest like it was there ideally but we've seen all this professionalism kicking in even from foreign troops and what you have in 1066 the Norwegian invasion the Norman invasion um, and in, in worlds that were very permeable there were lots of connections in, in, in contexts like it's actually um, you know as we've seen uh, we will see also better in the future Norman conquests were pretty damn brutal and I mean really brutal I mean it lasted actually a very long time effectively to pacify England it was the 30 years of of massacres and destruction it was pretty tough it was one of the toughest chapters of high, high medieval Europe but at the same time you realize that probably there were there was someone who, who could profit from that from the from actually pre-Roman, uh, excuse me, pre-Norman conquest, um, in terms of you know certain, someone opened the gates. Like you, you don't, 
conquer so easily uh, a counter in this regard um, and um, the 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 resistance in my opinion was in fact actually more popular than so aristocratic as we may think about that which in turn according to me speaks for still the the fact that anglo-saxon popular commit participation was was still burning under the ashes it didn't at, at that point it didn't make it of course to compete with the frankish models that the normans brought in um, but still the normans had to struggle to reshape uh, substantially the anglo-saxon society albeit not erasing it of course but just to, to make that that feudal model essentially at that point fit in, into it um, and that's something you don't see as i said at the begin beginning of the video the anglo-saxons are that interesting because actually if you think about it they're the only and i mean the only romano germanic kingdom that actually survived that long and of which you can't see the evolution that for other peoples you can't see you can't see because they were conquered essentially by someone else um, in this case well in england it finished like, like that too but still the Norman conquest at the end of the day um, couldn't do without the Anglo-Saxon system in itself this is very important this is true also of other areas of of Europe um, is that there are significant continuities in certain regional re or provincial realities that owe much just uh, to the previous um, you know pre Carolingian or maybe pre Muslim conquests but um, in the case of Anglo-Saxon England, it's a bit like the like this would become effectively an English kingdom. It would take a lot, <laughs> like you know, the the, the French, uh, excuse me, the the English kings would speak French for a consistently long time. But at the end of the day, as we know, the, the, the Anglo-Norman kingdom eventually would would evolve to something else, and and effectively in, in a kingdom of England that was was unique. In its own regard, I mean, every kingdom is unique, but the the English one had certain characteristics that are really very, very, very peculiar, and that owe much, surely, to the pre-Norman uh, uh, character of, of the same kingdom. So, we will expand on this concept further. I I did create a playlist on medieval Britain and Ireland, so you know. I will updating I uh, will be updating that um, but for now I will stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye